21. Approaches to New Edinburgh Spaceport. Caledonia. Sky March. Federated Commonwealth. 1412 hours. 13th of April, 3057. Balanced on shrieking, thrusting spears of white-hot plasma, the Union-class dropships, Endeavour, Valiant, and Defiant, drifted down out of a cloudless sky. Spherical, painted black and grey, each massed 3,500 tons, and was being gentled toward Caledonia's surface on thundering Star League V-250 plasma thrusters, which gulped down tons of atmosphere, superheated it, in parallel linked fusion plants and spewed it out astern at temperatures approaching those of the core of a star. Four nacelles evenly spaced about their thrusters split open, disgorging the heavy cylindrical feet of their landing legs. Closer and closer they came toward the spaceport, dropping past five kilometers now. Four of the Legion's aerospace fighters, released while the flight of the dropships was still in space, circled at a distance, protecting their larger, clumsier charges from air attack, scanning the area for any military threat from air or ground. Aboard the dropship Endeavour, Grayson Carlyle stood in ship operations, ignoring the thrumming vibration of the drive rattling against the soles of his feet through the steel deck studying the screen of a large monitor set to display the view from one of the ship external cameras. Regulation directed all personnel to remain in their acceleration couches during atmospheric maneuvers and until the pilot sounded the all-clear, but the Endeavour had already completed its necessary heavy-duty maneuvers and was descending at only a few meters per second. No sudden maneuvers were expected or necessary and Grayson wanted to take advantage of the ship's dwindling altitude to get a good look at the city of New Edinburgh. Left five, he said, speaking for the benefit of the console's voice command circuits, and enhance. The picture from an altitude of 20 kilometers was remarkably clear and steady. The camera was computer-controlled to maintain the image despite the dropship's movements or the buffeting of the wind. At Grayson's spoken command, a square appeared in the center of the screen, shifted left, then expanded swiftly to zoom in on the selected region. The view showed a portion of the spaceport spread out beneath the slowly descending dropship, as well as a nearby park or public square surrounded by buildings. The square was filled to overflowing with a great black mass that seemed to quiver and seethe as Grayson watched it. Magnify! he said, times five. Again, a graphic square appeared on the screen, then expanded, magnifying the view. Now the black mass was revealed as individual people, standing shoulder to shoulder in a great, seething mob. A riot, or a massive demonstration. He widened the angle of his scan and ran a search for large heat sources. There, three of them, battle max, moving toward the town plaza. Make that four. A fourth heat source appeared to be lurking among the warehouses on the northeast side of the spaceport, some distance away from the main demonstration. Why was it all the way over there? A backup for the others in case the crowd broke that way? An ambush? Major Fry came up behind him, looking over his shoulder at the screen. Trouble, Colonel? Looks like... Better pass the word for the ground troops to go out armed and in armor. They are not, repeat, not to engage, however, unless and until they're fired upon. We still don't know who the enemy is there. Grayson thought again about Alex and McCall. There was still no word from either one, still no break in the government's jamming of all radio frequencies. He'd been almost frantic for the several hours after he'd seen Folker's film of the battle at the Citadel. Somehow he'd remained almost impassive, though it had been all he could do not to deck Kellen Folker then and there. In the hours that followed, however, Grayson had arrived at several conclusions. 1. The fact that he'd seen a man in what looked like Nighthawk armor get shot and fall into a canyon did not necessarily mean that the man was either Davis McCall or his son. 
it could have been someone else. 2. The fact that a person had fallen into a canyon after being shot didn't necessarily mean that he was dead. There was no way to tell from that brief glimpse on video how deep the canyon was, and Nighthawk suits were astonishingly tough. 3. Grayson had decided he couldn't trust Falker, not when the man was the representative of a government that clearly preferred to control all information about itself in order to control its own people. Falker had a sliminess about him, about his manner that set Grayson's teeth on edge, and Grayson could easily believe that the man might have staged or forged the entire video sequence. Why? Grayson still wasn't sure, but he had a distinct impression that Falker was trying to tie Grayson and the Grey Death more closely to Wilmarth and the governor's stewardship of Caledonia. Rather than returning to Caledon in a shuttle, Falker had remained aboard the Endeavour, where he'd spent much of the past five days in attempts to convince Grayson that the Jacobite jihadist rebellion was the work of anarchists enemies of the governor, and of enemies of the Federated Commonwealth. The Legion, Falker had insisted, was one of the two battle mech units being deployed to Caledonia, an indication, he claimed, of just how important this world was to the Federated Commonwealth, in order to keep the peace. He'd brought with him several memory clips filed with hundreds of gigabytes of data, with detailed operational orders for the Legion to deploy from New Edinburgh spaceport, secure New Edinburgh, and then initiate martial law. The second unit, Falker said, would be a battalion of the 3rd Davion Guards, formerly stationed at neighboring Hesperus II, but soon to arrive in system for deployment, either at New Edinburgh or at the city of Stirling, to the north. Grayson had done a lot of thinking about the situation during the final leg of the passage to Caledonia. He was in a damned tight position, both politically and ethically. As the Baron of Glengarry, he owed his primary allegiance to Victor Davion, prince and ruler of the Federated Commonwealth. That title of nobility, however, meant little to him personally. The Legion was his life, and his life's work. So far as his allegiance as a mercenary was concerned, that had been purchased decades ago by House Steiner. Though mercenary units didn't necessarily stay loyal to one employer, those that did were in fact rarities. Grayson Carlyle's political sympathies lay more with the Steiners than any of the other great houses of the inner sphere. The Steiner world of Verfandi had given the Great Death its first contract those many years ago, when Grayson had first formed the unit. And in their current stint, he had actually signed on with Katrina Steiner before she'd abdicated in favor of her daughter Melissa. His contract had never officially been with House Davion or the Federated Commonwealth. He sympathized with the disaffectation many Lyrans felt for the Davion emphasis being given to the alliance of their two great realms. Prince Victor was currently ruling from New Avalon, and seemed to be more concerned with maintaining his power than being fair to his subjects. Quite apart from the politics of the matter, though, Grayson disliked it when people in power, those accustomed to having their own way, attempted to use the Grey Death Legion for their own political ends. That had happened more than once in the past, and Grayson was certain that someone was trying to do it again. But who? And for what purpose? Not Volker, certainly. The man was a go-betweener, not a mover. Wilmarth? Possible, but from what he'd heard so far, unlikely. Field Marshal Gareth? A distinct possibility. That one certainly had ambitions, and sympathy for the Sky Separatists as well. But there was no way to sort out his conflicting emotions or loyalties before he reached Caledonia and found out for himself what the situation there was. One thing was certain. Major Kellen Falker was not making it easier to feel sympathy for the legitimate government of Caledonia. The man was there at Grayson's side at every opportunity, attempting to sway him, reminding him that the Jacobites and Jihadists were in rebellion against their legally appointed governor and against the rightful authority of the Federated Commonwealth. He continually harped on the same theme, 
"'You are the Baron of Glengarry, Colonel. "'You owe your oath of fealty to Prince Victor. "'We're facing the Prince's enemies here, "'and it is your sworn duty to destroy them.' "'By the time they'd completed their final de-orbit burn "'and entered Caledon's atmosphere, "'Grayson had no idea who was right and who was wrong on that world. "'All he knew was that the first thing he must do "'was find Davis and Alex. "'And if they were alive,' he would learn from them the true situation on Caledonia. If they were not, then someone was going to pay for their deaths, and pay very dearly indeed. There they are, Alex said, pointing excitedly into the sky. McCall, one-handed, held a set of electronic binoculars to his eyes and peered up toward the zenith. Three brilliant white stars, set against the blue of the afternoon sky, were drifting swiftly down. Through the binoculars he could make out details of hull and laser turret, and the stylized skull of the Great Death. Ay, lad, that's them. Looks like the Endeavor, the Defiant and the Valiant, all three of Third Bat's dropships. Though I wouldn't be surprised to see your father with them. Now all we have to do is figure out how to contact them. Wearing their Nighthawk armor, but with helmets removed, the two men were seated together in the high, open cockpit of a spidery-legged agromech, a relic of a CK-3 cherry-picker at least two centuries old that had been volunteered to the cause by a Dundee farmer. The man was a jihadist and a pacifist, but as he'd put it when he'd showed up at the river camp the morning after the meeting in Moreyport, I'm a peaceable man, but enough is enough. These bastards can take their damn tribulation and their righteous elsewhere. The cherry picker had been equipped with machine guns and a jury rigged laser. The igniter from a small household fusion plant with the safeties stripped off and the output boosted by removing the governor. The device was now the equivalent of a small laser, and though no one could promise that it would fire more than once or twice before burning out, it gave the CK-3 at least that many shots before the agromech was smashed to pieces. McCall hoped the thing wouldn't have to see combat this afternoon, but he knew better than to take that as a given. He'd been certain that the Legion dropships were arriving when Reaver lookouts had reported that Bloodspiller troops had begun getting into position around the spaceport several hours ago. Wilmarth obviously wanted to keep the rebels away from the Great Death Forces, until he was sure that the Legion was on his side. The rebels' response had been suggested by the two legionaries with them. Another huge demonstration to be held in the plaza outside the new Edinburgh spaceport terminal. Nearly 20,000 people were expected, a crowd that would test Wilmarth's crowd control capabilities to their limits, and distract them long enough for McCall and Alex to make the sprint to the dropships. The agromech had been partly disassembled three days ago and moved by truck and cargo hovercraft to the spaceport's warehouse district. There, inside a warehouse donated by another secret member of the Reavers, the CK-3 had been reassembled and its makeshift weaponry mounted. The jury-rigged firepower would be useless in a tangle with a real battle mech, but if Wilmarth's troops tried pursuing them out onto the landing field, a burst of machine gun or laser fire might discourage them. Now McCall and Alex were sitting inside the mech, waiting for their chance. The roof and south wall of the warehouse had been rolled open by the half-dozen armed reavers waiting there with them, and, once the building's interior was open to the sky, the two legionaries could watch the dropship's final approach. The squad's spherical shapes were now close enough that McCall could see details of their hulls and markings even without the binoculars. If he and Alex only had some laser com gear, they could have flashed a message to the Endeavor right now. The distant rumble of the demonstration off to the west was swiftly drowned out by the piercing, shrieking thunder of the descending trio of dropships. Once again, he wished they could use their radios to contact the colonel directly, but the planet was still blanketed with heavy jamming. Narrow windows had been reserved for government communications, but without the necessary codes and frequency sets, there was no way for the Reavers to take advantage. Laser communications would have been better yet. 
even though limited to line of sight ranges, there was no way you could jam a laser com. That equipment, however rare and valuable, was simply not available. Actually, McCall thought with a wry grin to himself, there was another way they could have used laser communications, though it was too late to do it now. Hand lasers took too long to recycle after each shot to be useful in transmitting a code, but there were targeting lasers and ranging devices that could have been adapted. Aimed at the Endeavor and switched rapidly on and off, they would have attracted the immediate attention from the dropships' defensive computers, which registered any laser energy striking the ship's hull. If the ship's weapon officer had noted the irregular pattern of dots and dashes... Unfortunately, McCall hadn't thought of that in time to set something up. No matter. The mere sight of a spindly-legged agromech striding across the tarmac would alert the colonel. After all, it was Grayson Carlyle himself who pioneered the use of jury-rigged agros on Verthandi over three decades ago, and he'd know what was up. Just so long as some trigger-happy newbie in the Legion didn't get the wrong idea and shoot first, before the colonel had a chance to tell him not to. In swirling clouds of superheated steam, the three dropships grounded one after the other into yawning starport receiving bays, refractory, ferrocrete-rhymed craters half-filled with water to cool the walls after they were licked by the flaming, star-core fury of the ship's main thrusters. Settling deeply into the yield of the shock-absorbing legs, the hulls shuddered for a moment as the thrusters powered down. Then they were still. Enclosed boarding ramps slid out from the receiving bay walls, magnetically locking to each ship's primary entry port. This was luxury. On most combat drops, dropships landed in open fields and didn't have the luxury of air-conditioned ways leading to underground slidewalks, maglev transports, and the cool, brightly lit interior of the starport terminal. Now the mech loading bays on the sides of the dropships slid slowly open, and the debarkation elevators began trundling the first of the battalion's massive battle machines to the ground. Ramps descending into each landing pit gave the mechs easy access to the open tarmac of the port field. It never failed to amaze McCall, even after all his years of experience, just how huge a dropship actually was. Their interiors were so cramped that a single company of mech warriors, techs, and auxiliary personnel were crowded into a stinking, claustrophobic, elbow-in-my-eye intimacy that swiftly became intolerable after just a few days of intersystem boost. Aboard ship, there were never enough lavatories, fewer showers, and men and women were crowded together in the troop base without even the memory of what privacy was like. Civilian transports were somewhat better, but military jobs couldn't afford to cater to humans when every single kilo saved on measures for comfort or privacy could be applied to another kilo of expendables, of mech parts, of military equipment. Seen from outside, however, even from well over a kilometer away, and with lower halves of each ship hidden in its landing cradle, dropships were enormous, especially when their battle mechs began moving about outside to give them a sense of scale. McCall knew mechs better than he did dropships, knew their sheer mass and bulk and complexity, but a Union-class dropship, measuring 75 meters from stern thrusters to bridge dome, towered almost eight times taller than a mech, and dwarfed the largest atlas by its sheer bulk. Even nestled in their landing craters, the upper halves of the dropships towered above the deploying battle mechs. McCall studied the deployment through his binoculars. There was a vindicator, a catapult, and a hunchback, obviously working together as part of a lance. That would be Lieutenant Anders's combat lance, the first company of the third bat. He saw no sign of Grayson Carlyle's victor. Well, lad, there's no sense in waiting longer. I was hoping to spot your father first. But that's Larry Anders's catapult over there. I think he can be trusted not to shoot first and ask questions later. Still, I wish I could spot the colonel's victor. It would be nice to walk up to him, mech to mech. 
We can wait a bit longer, Alex said. In fact, we probably should. There's no sign yet that the blood spiller mechs have started moving against the demonstrators. The signal, arranged early that morning, was to be a green flare fired over the plaza. Once Wilmarf's mechs were moving toward the plaza, the agromech could scamper across the tarmac in relative safety. If McCall and Alex broke from cover too soon, it was possible that the government mechs, which had been positioned about the spaceport in order to guard the approaches to the landing area itself, would see the little agromech and move to block it. The thing was unarmored. A single solid hit could probably take it down. All right, lad, McCall said, deciding. We can wait another ten minutes. Then we'll go, whether your father is parading in his victor or not. Grayson was not in his mech. Instead, he, Major Fry, and a half-dozen Legion staff officers had accompanied Major Falker and his two lieutenants through the boarding tube, then gone by underground maglev to the starport terminal a kilometer to the north. There were militia guards in black and yellow armor everywhere throughout the terminal, and Grayson had the impression they'd been there for some time. Just what is it you want us to see, Major? Grayson asked as he stepped into a circular, glass-enclosed lounge. A brief elevator ride had taken them up a slender tower to the saucer-shaped observation area, which gave a splendid 360-degree view of the entire port, as well as the city of New Edinburgh sprawling across gently rolling ground to the north and east. Grayson took one brief glance toward the south, verifying that the third bat's max were indeed deploying as he'd ordered, then followed Falker and the others toward the north side of the lounge. This, Colonel, Falker said. I got word by radio as we were landing. You've been in radio communication with your superiors? Grayson was angry. Damn it, man. I've been asking for access to your people for five days. I told you, Colonel, I am to be your liaison with the governor. I was informed this morning that a demonstration had begun outside of the spaceport terminal. Now, though, it appears to be getting out of hand. I thought this would give you the best view. Falker was right. From almost one hundred meters up, Grayson and the others could look down onto the plaza in front of the starport terminal almost directly below, getting an aerial view even more close and detailed than that afforded by the Endeavor's scanners during the descent. The crowds had filled the plaza with a black sea of people parked everywhere by the colorful dancing points of waving flags and hand-carried signs. Grayson couldn't read the signs at this distance, but could imagine what many of them said. Down with Wilmarth, perhaps, and machines equals death. There was no sign of the four battle mechs he'd spotted from the dropship. Perhaps Wilmarf's troops were holding off until things really got out of hand. As you can see, Colonel, Falker said, gesturing out the window, things have become impossible here. The governor only has a few mechs and a few armored vehicles available. The two of the mechs and a number of transports were knocked out last week by your people. I remind you, sir, that you were brought here to restore order. What is it you want of me, Major Falker? The Major waved at the window. You have Max. Your orders are to deploy your battalion into the city, seize it, and disperse the rioters. Grayson's eyes widened. Major Falker, are you suggesting that I turn battle Max against the people down there? Those people, Colonel are in rebellion against the duly constituted government of this world. Falker drew himself up straighter, his mouth a hard line, his eyes dark. Colonel Carlyle, as the personal representative both of Governor Wilmarth and of Field Marshal Gareth, I order you to deploy your full force against this rebellion, even if it means total destruction of this city. Good God, man, do you hear yourself? Do you have any idea what you're saying? I'm ordering you to destroy the city and crush the Jacobite rebellion. Grayson took a deep breath. There were some orders that must be obeyed, even though obeying them meant death. There were others, though, that meant the death of a man's spirit, 
of his soul. No. What did you say? I said no. I refused the order. Damn you, Carlyle. This is an emergency. The governor has already declared martial law. You can't refuse a direct order on the governor's authority. I just did. I will not see my legion used to incinerate civilians. What you're asking isn't war. It's a civilian massacre. I can have you and your whole damned legion listed as outlaws, Volker shouted. As contract breakers. I'll see you broken for this. You'll never get another mercenary assignment. Ever. No one in the inner sphere would hire a man, would trust a man, who'd refuse the legal order from his employer. Grayson crossed his arms. I can't accept the order, Major, and you know it. I couldn't accept it if your Governor Wilmarf were here to deliver it himself. Volker exchanged a hard glance with his two lieutenants, then gave them a nod. His hand dropped to his holstered sidearm, dragging the weapon free with an ugly rasp of steel on Lerner. In that case, Colonel, I'm going to have to place you under arrest. Your weapons, please, all of you. Grayson's hand had moved automatically to the butt of his own laser, but at the same instant he heard the snick of drawn bolts all around the public lounge. The small group of grey death officers was surrounded by black and yellow armored militiamen, who had them covered from every side. The grey death legion, Falker said with a dark grin, is now under my command, and you will do exactly as I say.'